in terms of uh, practices that we need to observe and uh, those things we need to require in order for all of us to remain safe. Um, your lay leaders are listed in the bulletin sent to you, uh, members and uh, regular worshipers, and their contact information, you can let them know. You can uh, call me or send me an email. Information will be on the screen in just a few moments. Uh, we need your help, so please uh, communicate with us. Uh, during this time of uh, great concern, a lot of people out of work, growing death toll in the United States and, ar and around the world, we are um, we're praying. And today, uh, we are looking at uh, Philippians chapter 4. Our worship comes from that chapter this morning. Paul the Apostle is writing to his beloved pen pals in Philippi. They miss each other, and uh, the church has sent help more than once to help support Paul's ministry efforts. Uh, the apostle is sitting in a dank, more than likely smelly and dark jail cell, and uh, he's overflowing with joy in all of that. The question is, how can this be? Perhaps this morning, as we look at Philippians chapter 4, we will be able to discover or see how we can discover joy even in great difficulty times of stress. A few heads up for today's worship. Our Bibles are going to be open to Philippians chapter 4, and we'll have words on screen for singing, especially at the end of the service. We'll have a special song, He Giveth More Grace. You may be familiar with it or not, but it's pretty easy to pick up. Just two verses, and it's a wonderful way to end our service today about finding joy in times of great stress. The children will have a message for them in just a moment or so, but first, uh, we're going to have our prayer time together. So if, you need so if you need to prepare, go ahead and hit that pause button. Go get yourself that cup of coffee or tea, whatever you need. And don't forget your Bible, open to Philippians chapter 4. And welcome. Worship continues with prayer and then our time with the children. Let's pray together. Father, we give thanks that your word from Philippians is going to remind us today about joy. With so much of the world and its culture huddling against the cold fear of coronavirus, and also the angry fear of each other, joy has been in a lockdown on our planet. Joy has been quarantined until things return to something people call normal. Lord, help us understand that living absent from our lives, surrendered to you, the anger, the hoarding, the fear, the despair, of which we see so much in this day, is going to be the world's new normal. And that kind of normal is human. It's flesh-driven. It's worldly. Lord, save us from our human tendency to this sin. Our hearts have to be renewed in Christ before there's any reformation of culture. And so, Lord, we ask for your grace to overcome our fear. We ask for your courage to live by your strength, not our weakness. We ask for wisdom to turn from our own wickedness and compassion to take the first steps in extending your love to others. Lord, allow us to once again know the joy of thy salvation. Father, we pray for our loved ones, family, friends, and fellow believers. We do have a long list. We pray for the sick and in hospital, those who are homebound and in nursing homes, lonely, despairing, in all things, O oh Lord, we acknowledge that you alone are God, and we are not. Grant us your peace as we lift our voices to pray, as your dear Son Jesus taught us together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Russell back again. Our question this morning centers around what Paul, the apostle, said in the book of Philippians. We're going to read that scripture in just a few moments, just before the sermon. But I want to give you a heads up on giving thanks. That's what Paul was talking about in the text that we're going to read. You give thanks for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes you give thanks because people are your friends and uh, you are thankful for them. And sometimes they give you something, they give a gift of some sort. That happened in Paul's life and he was very thankful that the people in Philippi sent some money to help him to get along in his ministry to help tell others about Jesus. Here's a question for us. Do we say thanks uh, when somebody does something nice for us? And the bigger question is, how do you do that? How do you say thanks? Do you pay them for it? Do you, uh, do you give them a gift? Do you say nice words and just then forget about it? Well, there's a real, real, real big gift that we all know about that Jesus gave to each one of us. It was the gift of him coming to die so that our sins could be forgiven. He hung on the cross. He took our punishment. The Bible says that the punishment for sin, for doing the wrong stuff that we do, the punishment is death. And Jesus came to take our death. And in exchange, he gives us life. Now that is a pretty big gift. So what do you do? You just say thank you and go on. Do you uh, try to give him a gift back in return? How about buying it? I mean, pay Jesus for what he did for us. You know what the Bible says about that? The Bible says that not even if you have a zillion dollars is there enough money to buy salvation, to buy God's forgiveness. No, no, Jesus offers it entirely free. Oops. And here's what he really said about how to act about that salvation. Jesus said this to us, to his disciples. He said this, if you love me, if you really want to thank me, if you love me, do what I've told you to do. Basically, what he's told us to do is to go and give that gift to others, to go and tell others about him and how he did die for us so that our sins could be forgiven. That's worth more than a zillion dollars. Your life is everything. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you died for us. We thank you, Lord, that even though we don't have what it takes to buy salvation or to properly say thank you, you've told us what we can do because of your great gift, and that is to be your witness, to tell others who you are and what you've done for us. Help us to do that, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next time. Our message this morning is from Paul's letter to the Philippian church, chapter 4, beginning at verse 15. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I'm generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that's acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now all glory to God our Father forever and ever. Amen. Give my greetings to each of God's holy people, all who belong to Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send you their greetings. And all the rest of God's people send you greetings too, especially those in Caesar's household. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of the Lord for us, the people of God. Paul's life is a paradox. It's one that is filled with epic struggle and suffering. And at the same time, it's overflowing with joy. Seems like those are mutually exclusive, don't they? Joy, that centered, that centered, solid sense of well-being is one of Paul's major themes. It's something that is all throughout his letter to the Philippian church and his other letters. Paul, who was sitting in a dark 
stinking hole of a jail in Rome, writes to his beloved friends about how much God's joy was in his life. Paul's rejoicing was as real as the fingers on your hand. Had I been in Paul's shoes, I wonder if I would have been quite so positive. There are times when joy hardly seems real or even a remote possibility. In 1994, I was a pastor in Jacksonville, Florida, and I stood with a mother and father as we looked at the body of their 22-year-old son lying in a casket. They shared with me their son's great plans for the future. He was going to get a master's degree. He was going to advance in his job, and his, he had plans for a family, and his love for the Lord was, was on fire. And looking into that lifeless face in the box, the last thing I could imagine saying to this family was anything about joy. Sometimes words just won't do. The mom and dad told me how that young man worked very hard every day. He was never late to work. How he went to school at nights and how he studied hard. And there was lots of hugging and remembering at the funeral home that day. But I knew that that time would pass because in the morning there'd be a funeral service and soon we would be at the cemetery ready to lower a young man into a grave when that young man had hardly begun to live. It was not only hard to imagine joy, joy was absolutely completely, for me, AWOL, absent without official leave. And so I asked the Lord in my brokenness that night before the service to speak to my heart so that I could speak to this brokenhearted family. Very often, I'm a poor listener, so the Lord waited until the very last moment when I stepped up to the pulpit to speak to about 500 people, mostly Ricky's friends who had gathered there. And it was the faces of those young people that stopped me dead in my tracks. I had never seen most of them before and the faces were streaming with tears, with disbelief and stunned silence. Their faces were grieving, as the Bible says, as those who don't have any hope. And in that instant, the Lord spoke to my heart and the one-sided conversation went something like this. God said to my heart, Russell, among those young people are those who have left me out of their lives. A few of them have never even heard the gospel. Tell them all, I love you. What a sustaining message to my heart. I not only, I not only rediscovered joy for that hard moment that I was facing, I was downright happy for what was about to come. This would give meaning to Ricky's death. His friends were sitting there trying to make any kind of sense in the madness and the chaos of losing their friend. They were facing the reality that if it could happen to Ricky, 22 years old, strong, bright, alive, well, it could happen to them too. Ricky had plans for living. Now he was in a casket. Ricky's friend's attention was focused toward the pulpit, God's sacred desk. What an awesome responsibility. What an incredible joy I had to share the gospel of God's grace with people who were parched and dry with nothing but empty wells. They were in dire need of living water and it was my joy to be standing near the spigot and to turn it on. In retrospect, I can imagine more easily the joy that uh, the Apostle Paul felt sitting in that Roman jail cell. He and Ricky had similarities. They were both educated. They were energetic and ambitious in their respective fields. They were both tops. But Paul and Ricky were somewhat different in that Ricky had only lived a short while on this planet. Paul had already lived a full life and accomplished much for the cause of Christ. And now there he was in prison awaiting a criminal's execution, all because of his faithfulness, all because he was true to his calling in Jesus Christ. And in the middle of it all, in the middle of the worst possible circumstances, Paul would say, joy, unspeakable, full of glory. I want you to know, beloved, there's only one thing in this universe that can make a person joyful in that kind of chaos, of that kind of circumstance. It is the grace of Almighty God. So what I'd like to do is unpack a little bit of what grace actually does in a believer's life, in a human's heart. 
three things. The first thing is that grace makes you joyfully grateful, grateful. Paul was grateful for the gift that was brought by Epaphroditus. Now, this was a gift of money, of support for Paul's ministry. None of the other churches had shared in the financial needs of Paul's ministry. And Paul, Paul became joyfully grateful because the Philippian church had a proper sense of why they were giving. They didn't just give, they knew why they were giving. It was not just for Paul's sake. They knew that they were ministering in God's name to God's world with gifts that God had placed in their hands. Paul, on the other hand, was working to see the gospel spread. That was his call from God. Both the Philippian church and Paul were using the gift that God put in their hands. The circumstances were not wonderful in either situation, certainly for Paul sitting in that jail cell waiting uh, execution, but not for the Philippian church either because that was an impoverished church. But Paul could see, and so could the Philippian believers, they could see the purpose of God being worked out even in the worst case of misery. Paul wrote to his Philippian pen pals, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Paul had vision. He was able to look past the circumstances and see God's hand hard at work. And even more importantly, Paul knew that those circumstances are by God's design to accomplish God's purpose. God's purpose of grace makes you joyfully grateful. And secondly, grace not only makes you joyfully grateful, it makes you a joyful giver. Giving at times is a touchy, touchy subject. You, you know that, don't you? Uh, but I found out that it's only a touchy subject for those who have not yet gotten the idea that it is a joy to give and to give the way God wants you to give. <laughs> I remember the story about the old farmer who was listening to the preacher's sermon about giving and he got to the point the preacher did about the lottery and he said the lottery was such a devilish evil and how it was crippling the poor well i happen to agree with that preacher but afterwards the old farmer approached the pastor and he registered his objection he said preacher lottery ain't all that bad why if i won 10 million dollars i'd give half of it to the church the pastor said well how about if you won just a million i'd still give half to the church and the pastor said, well, how about if you had two pigs? He said, now, wait a minute, preacher. That ain't fair. You know I got two pigs. Hmm. Well, giving is never a touchy subject when the right conditions exist. And I found that there are two conditions. When they exist, giving is not a touchy subject. It's a joyful subject. Condition number one is this. People give when their hearts are touched, when their hearts are moved. I have a friend who is a vibrant professional man. He's also a serious Christian. He does tithe 10% to his church, but that's the beginning of his giving. He also manages to put dollars away each month for the purpose of finding God's needy spot, just the right spot that God calls him to. And he prays about this money that God will direct him to a godly need. This is a heart that's touched with compassion and enthusiasm for the gospel. I can tell that it gives him a great deal of joy to be able to give. Sunday school class in a church I served once had an ongoing ministry to the poorer kids in the neighborhood. They fed them. One church member confided in me that just giving a dollar or two above her tithe every week to help a needy child gave her more joy than anything else she does. When your heart is touched with compassion for people, you give joyfully. And the second condition that makes giving not so much a touchy subject is when people give sacrificially because their hearts have been transferred to God. There's a difference between the joy of giving and sacrificial giving. What's the difference? Well, Paul's pride and joy, the Philippian group, they were examples of sacrificial giving. One author has it this way. Their giving was exemplary because they gave out of rock bottom poverty. What is sacrificial giving? Sacrifice only comes under the influence of love. You give whether you perceive that you have something to give or not. You give whatever you can find to give. I have a coupon booklet that I treasure. 
It's handmade and it's from my three kids. It was given to me many years ago by uh, my kids on a Father's Day when they had no money. They had no money because they were UIS. That stands for Under the Influence of Seminary. Uh, we were broke and therefore they were too. So they gave me a handwritten book of credit vouchers. One voucher was good for a car wash. They would wash my car whenever I cashed it in. Another was good for a no gripe lawnmower usage. I'll let you know which of my children uh, gave, suggested that one. Um, still another coupon was for a whole day, and this is what was written on the coupon, a whole day of kids being good without dad having to remind anybody. I want to tell you, I have never cashed a single one of those coupons. They are much too precious to me. Those kids loved me and they gave sacrificially. Believe me, especially that lawnmower usage with no gripe, that was sacrificial. When you transfer your heart to God, like my kids transfer their hearts to me, God makes you a sacrificial giver. You get to the point where you just can't wait to give. So God's grace makes you joyfully grateful, first of all, and a joyful giver. And then lastly, grace makes you joyfully glorify God. Listen to what Paul wrote in verse 20 of our text. To, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. It seems Paul often sang the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Considering God deserves our praise, and we are created for him and not ourselves, it ought to be without question that we praise God joyfully instead of griping profusely. Seems we ought to be a little bit more like Paul, recounting the blessings until we just burst into the doxology. God's grace makes your attitude of gratitude grow. Paul was a prisoner. Most people would view that as a screeching, grinding halt to his ministry, but his imprisonment was actually the very thing that defined the ministry of Paul. While other people were mourning his circumstances, even the believers at Philippi, Paul saw an opportunity in this misery. I mean, what else could a Christian do with a soldier chained to him 24 hours a day. That's how they guarded Paul. A Roman would come in, a Roman soldier would come in with all of his weapons, but they would chain Roman soldier to Paul. And that was Paul's lot 24 hours a day. The Roman guards would change shifts every six or eight hours or so. And so he'd have three or four uh, people of captured audience every single day. And so what would he do? Paul began witnessing to them, telling them about Christ, the good grace of Jesus Christ, how it makes you joyful and a giver and a praiser of God. And he would win soldiers, Roman soldiers to Christ. Our dog, who is now with the Lord, good Methodist that she was, Gracie Cotton loved to wander whenever she got loose. And since we didn't have a fenced yard when she first came to live with us, the only option was walking on her on a leash when she let us do that, of course. She was a very small dog, but if that dog got wind of a squirrel, she would get highly motivated. The human being that was holding leash just had to hold on for dear life. In the very same way, the Roman emperor imagined that he had squashed Paul's preaching. He thought he had it all in hand. But as William Barclay put it, the crucified Galilean carpenter had already begun to rule those who ruled the greatest empire in the world. And so we come to the point of asking a question or two of ourselves. What are our circumstances? What are they doing to us? And what are we allowing those circumstances to keep us from doing? Are you joyful over the impact Christ is making on your part of the world because of what is happening in your life? Or are you groaning and griping every day because of the circumstances? Is the coronavirus collapse raining on the joy parade in your world? Multiplied thousands of so-called unfulfilled, unhappy people would see their world and their circumstances differently 
if they would transfer their hearts to Jesus Christ. The songwriter puts it this way, and these are the words we're going to sing in just a moment. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's forgiveness is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Circumstances are not a choice. Sometimes it's the devil, sometimes it's the Lord, and sometimes it's just stuff happening. But joy is a matter of choice. You can choose to surrender your heart and your life to God's will, to know him and his power and his salvation, because that is available by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and the sacrificial gift of his death on the cross. It was grace, God dying for you. And when you accept his offer to know him, there's no limit, there's no measure to God's power, his love, his grace, that brings joy unspeakable to your life. Let's pray together. Father God, your grace is more than just a ticket to heaven someday. Your grace brings heaven's joy to live in our souls. May it be that inexpressible joy, which gives inexhaustible peace with unlimitable power, May it be so that it fills even the tiniest crevices of our hearts and lives. For the glory, honor, and praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit, to honor and lift up the majesty of the Father who gives such grace. Let it be so in each of our lives. Amen. And now let's sing together, He giveth more grace. that's worship for this morning. We'll see you next time. Don't forget, three weeks in the parking lot at Pleasant Hill in the open air.